I'm the director of middle school here at Chet. Wow, that just came alive. Well, I am, uh, again, glad to be here with you. You will usually find me down the hall uh, with your fifth and sixth graders or seventh and eighth graders. I love getting to work with students, but I'm excited to share with you this morning about this series we're talking about, Street Level Faith. Uh, have you ever received advice from someone that you just, you knew you should have taken and you just did not take it? Has anybody ever given you something that you knew in the back of your mind, I really should be paying attention to what they're saying to me right now, but... I'm just not going to do anything with this. I am the most guilty person of doing this, and we're going to talk about this in a rather humiliating story in a moment. Uh, But every summer, I am warned by the student ministry department, please put sunscreen on. As you can see, I am a pasty, bald, white European. Uh, So I am the sun's worst enemy. He will fry me alive. And every summer... I'm told this, don't, don't go outside without sunscreen, and I say, yeah, 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 I know, I know, that's good advice, and, and we're there in the smart part of my brain, I agree, and I nod, but then I don't do it. So let me show you, rather painfully, what happens to people who don't follow the advice of their good co-workers. <laughs> this was the result of last year's adventure trip. Uh, someone told me last night when I showed him this, it looks like two Tylenol capsules. <laughs> I wish it took away pain as opposed to bringing it. But this is what happens when I don't listen to what I'm told. This is when I am a hero only and not a doer. And that is what we're talking about this morning in James. Um, yeah, it was pretty rough to recover from. I promise you that. And my co-workers in student ministries continually laugh about that. Um, but we are talking about doing and not being heroes only this morning. We are in week two of this series we're calling Street Level Faith, talking about the book of James, the letter of James. And as we learned last week, James is the half-brother of Jesus. So this is a really interesting letter because there's not many people who we have kind of a background like that on James. You see, James uh, is not first mentioned in the letter of James. He actually comes up in the Gospels, not by name, but we are told in Mark chapter 3, in the Gospel of Mark, that one time when Jesus was preaching that his mother and brothers were there. And as he was speaking, as he was teaching about who he was, what he was here to do, his mother and brothers say he's a lunatic. Jesus has lost his mind. And so James began his relationship with his brother in not the place that he ends up. He doesn't start as a follower of Jesus. He doesn't start as someone who believes in him and hopes in him. He starts as a critic. And so I find it really interesting when I read the letter of James and seeing where this man's story ends up because James comes to see that his half-brother Jesus is the savior of the world. James comes to see that in Jesus, this man that he once thought was a lunatic, everything that he could possibly need or want is found in him. That's what he says about his sibling, his older brother who he grew up with. Now, the reason I find that so interesting is because this letter is primarily about how to live as a Christian. It's about how to follow the words of Jesus. It's about how you live out what Jesus has asked you to live out. It's packed with these analogies and these stories and these examples of how those who call themselves Christians, those who follow Jesus and trust in him, how they are supposed to conduct themselves. So to come from James, a man who once called Jesus a lunatic, How interesting is it that now he's saying, follow every word he says, worship him, come to him, trust in him. It's so interesting to me. So without spending any more time uh, thinking about that, let's just go ahead and read what James has got for us today. So we are picking up in verse 19 through 27 of James 1. This is what it says. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion 
is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So as we talk about this, we're going to think about three things this morning. We are going to think about hearing, doing, and living. We hear a little bit that just in the text where James tells us about hearing and doing. But to start with, I want to tell you another story. I, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm a very easily distracted person, right? We already talked about how I don't listen uh, to my friends in student ministry, but uh, I also don't listen well to my wife. Uh, and so there are many occasions at which I'm home and uh, I'm usually playing on an iPad, playing some ridiculous, meaningless game, or I'm Wikipediaing things that no one ever needs to find out about or study. Uh, and I see out the corner of my eye, my wife's mouth moving. And I can hear something coming out there. There's like, th- something is happening, but I don't know what it is. Because I need to beat my high score on Angry Birds. <laughs> so I sit there and I listen. I do what any responsible, reasonable husband would do. You don't think about what's being said. You just say yes, yes, and you nod your head. Well, 20 minutes later, Janae comes back. And she says, did you do it? And I'm completely lost for words, and this is a dangerous situation now, because I said yes. So I have to quickly try and figure out how to get out of this. And before I can find my way out, Jenny always says, you weren't listening when you said yes, were you? You didn't hear what I said. James is writing a letter to a bunch of people who have all said yes to Jesus, who have all decided that they want to make him their Lord, that they want to follow him, that they want to go the distance with Jesus. And he's writing to them right after they have gone through this period of persecution where they have been scattered all around the Middle East. You see, right after the church forms, after Jesus goes to heaven, the church is persecuted by both Rome and by the Jewish leaders. And they end up leaving Jerusalem and being scattered all around the region. And so James, who's left back in Jerusalem, is the leading the Jerusalem church. He writes out to these Christians that are scattered all over the region, these ones who are trying to follow Jesus in this brand new set of circumstances, and he wants to talk to them about hearing. This is what he says. He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls." We finished off last week in verses 17 and 18 talking about the God who gives every good gift. This God that loves us, that again and again shows himself to be faithful, loving, true. And James was sharing this with them as they were in the midst of these difficult circumstances, these painful circumstances, trying to remind them, your God is good. He has loved you when you were at your worst. He has been with you when you were not thinking about him. That's who God is. He is the God that gives every good gift that you've ever received. And now he turns and he says, I want you to hear. All of us should be quick to hear. Now why is he saying that? Why is James coming to talking about hearing? I think because James knows that there is a hearing problem in the heart of every person who's ever lived. We are so prone, especially with things like the gospel, to nod our heads, to say yes, but not really hear what we have been told. We kind of run through it in our minds. We quickly think, what's our opinion about this? And then we move on without really hearing what's been said to us. And James knows that if these Christians are to make it, if they are to really live out the life that God has gifted to them, then they need to hear what he said. They need to pay attention to what he's told them. They cannot forget what he has done for them. If we go to verse 21, he says, Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What's the implanted word? The implanted word is that message, that word that Jesus spoke for those that he saved. It's the gospel. It's the message that Jesus has done what none of us could ever do for our sake so that we could have what we could never deserve. That's the message of the gospel. Now, there is an epidemic, I think, in many churches all over the world where we have not heard that message, where we sit in sermons Sunday after Sunday and we listen, but we don't hear what is being said to us. We don't hear what Jesus has done, who Jesus is for us. 
And I know this firsthand because I grew up in a church where a pastor I had would often ask people what he called the killer question. He would meet with people every week who had grown up in church, who had been in church for decades, and he would ask them, how do you go to heaven? What is it that Jesus wants from you? And time and time again, people would answer, well, I've got to be a good person. I've got to do, I've got to do all the things that make God happy. If I do all the right things, and I please God, and I live as a good person, then one day he'll let me into heaven. But that's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus said. That's not even close to what Jesus said. That's actually the antithesis of what Jesus said. This is what Jesus told us, in summary. He told us that we are worse than we could possibly imagine, far more broken than we understand, but that we are more loved than we could ever dare dream. Jesus told us that we are more broken than we could ever imagine, but that we are more loved than we can ever dare dream. That's the gospel. There's not a hint of what you need to do in there. There's not a hint of live this moral code, do this stuff, and then God will love you. That message is when you are at your worst, God in heaven loved you so much that he wanted to give you his only son, that he wanted to give you the fountain of all creation, the one who loves you apart from what you do, but who loves you by grace. That is what James wants these people to hear. He's saying, listen to what Jesus told us. Remember what Jesus told us, the implanted word that's able to save your souls. It's not about you creating your righteousness in the midst of these difficult circumstances. It's not about you doing all the right things and saying the right things and being the right person. It's about Jesus being all of those things for you. That's what the good news is. That's what the message of Christianity is, is Jesus is everything we need. All we need to do is look to him, trust in him, receive the implanted word. So I asked this morning, are we listening to what God is saying? Are we hearing that message? Are we hearing that our righteousness is in Christ alone, by grace alone? Are we seeing his goodness? Are we still thinking about what we need to do? Are we trying by our own efforts to craft righteousness for ourselves, to impress God? If we don't hear that, there is, there is so much missing that we can't, we can't move on. There is no doing without hearing that. But of course, that's not where it ends. That's not where James finishes. There is doing. And what is that? I want to show you a picture of a man called Michael Nicholson. This is Michael Nicholson right here. He is a 72-year-old man, uh, and he is famous for something in particular. He is famous for having 29 different advanced degrees. He has three specialist degrees, two associate's degrees, one bachelor's degree, 22 master's degrees, and one doctoral degree. The registrar's office at one of the schools he attended said he has the record for the most degrees awarded to any one person in the school's history. And across all of these degrees, he has covered things like philosophy, theology, economics, business, public administration. He has covered so many fields, we couldn't even begin to imagine to gather what he has gathered. But he's a real quirk about Michael Nicholson. Michael Nicholson has never once held a job in any of the degrees that he's gotten. He has never been an engineer, no matter how many degrees he's got in that. He's never been a manager, no matter how many degrees he's been in that. Michael Nicholson is a certified expert in numerous fields, but he has never served as an employee in any of them. He said, I just stayed in school and took menial jobs to pay for the education and just made a point of getting more degrees, and eventually I retired so that I could go full-time to school. This, this is my favorite part. I would like to get 33 or 34. I'm almost there. When I complete that, I'll feel like I've completed my basic education. This is a strange guy. <laughs> now, this is the most important, important part for us this morning. This is what one of his professors said. Michael loves to learn, but he does not like responsibility. Michael Nicholson loves to learn, but he does not like responsibility. How many Christians could that sentence describe? 
How many of us love to try and fill our minds with more scripture, with more of who Jesus is, with more of what the Bible says, but struggle to live it out? I'm guilty. I'm probably the most guilty in the room. James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. See, being a Christian goes far beyond holding a certain theological belief. It goes far beyond understanding something intellectually. Being a Christian is a way of life. It is an identity that shapes everything about you. Absolutely everything. Now, I want to pause for a minute. Because if we forget what we've just talked about, if we forget what we have heard about the gospel, about who Jesus is, we will immediately miss the entire point of what we're about to talk about. If we go straight into this doing and and living this out, and we forget that the entire Christian life is not built upon what we do, it's built upon what Jesus does, then nothing James is about to say is going to have its intended impact on us. So I need you to remember that. We need to know that everything about being a Christian is built not on what we do, but it's built on what Jesus does. So bearing that in mind, what is doing about? Doing is about taking what you believe, what you know to be true because of Jesus, and letting that change and shape the way that you choose to live your life. Because it is possible to love Jesus, to trust in Jesus, and to never let that have the impact on your life that Jesus has asked it to have, wants it to have. It's entirely possible to call yourself a Christian and believe these things and then never actually live anything that Jesus said out. This is what C.S. Lewis said. He said, if what you call your faith in Christ does not involve taking the slightest notice of what Jesus said, then it's not faith at all. Not faith or trust in him, but only intellectual acceptance of some theory about him. It's possible to call yourself a Christian without ever letting that faith impact the way that you live your life. Now, I am guilty when thinking about this book and reading this book of saying that James is one of the most blunt people in the Bible. He says things very hard, sometimes really hard to work through what he's saying but he's not as blunt as Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. I've wrestled with that verse for a long time in my life because I know that my relationship with Jesus is built upon what he has done for me. But at the same time, that same Jesus who did that for me is saying, if you love me, Andrew, then this will change the way that you live your life. You will obey what I have asked you to obey. It's very uncomfortable. It's a hard saying. And again, if we look at that verse and what Jesus said in that moment, out of the context of everything else, we'll get confused. We'll think that it's just about doing things. But what Jesus is saying, actually, even in that verse, is far deeper than just doing things to please him. In that verse, when he says, if you love me, you will obey my commands, he's talking about what motivates us, what governs us. He's not talking about the surface level things that we do. He's talking about what informs those things that we do. What do you love most? Who do you love most? Who are you living your life for and because of? If you love something other than Jesus, if your heart really at the bottom of it is dedicated to something other than Jesus, then what you do will be a result of your love for that thing. For example, if I love myself the most, if, if who I am and what I desire in my life is the most important thing to me, then all of the choices I make, all of the decisions I make, everything I do will be about serving that master. It will be about doing what I love to do. So I will make decisions based on what makes me feel best, what makes me feel most comfortable. If what I love most is my job, then every decision I make, everything that I dedicate myself to will be about my love for that job. But if Jesus is the one that I love, if he is the one that I trust in, 
if he is the one that captures my heart's attention most, then everything I do will be out of a love for him. It will be out of a desire to please him, to bring him joy. Not because I have to, but because I love him. Think about it this way. If I was with my wife, Janae, and I told Janae, I really, really love you, but I never spent a single hour of any day doing anything to serve my wife, to give to my wife, then how could I really say that I loved her? If you love something, then it is a joy for you to serve that thing, to give yourself to that thing, to think about how your decisions serve that thing. If you love someone, your decisions should be dedicated joyfully out of pleasure towards that thing. Does that make sense? That's, that's what Jesus is saying. See, Jesus is not rooting anything in what we do. That's why that this makes sense. It's because he's not saying this is about what you do. It's not saying you do this thing to keep me happy and then I love you. He's saying because I love you, because I've given myself to you, because there is nothing that I withhold from you, then you are free to love me, to enjoy me, to be in relationship with me. That's what God has done for us. I had a brilliant analogy about this from another pastor who said, if you want your child to uh, pick a violin, you don't give them a list of things and say, here's how you learn violin, do all of these things, and then, then you will love the violin. As a, as a recipient of that type of parenting, I can tell you every instrument that was given to me that way, I was like, I'm never playing that thing. But if you take your child to a concert, and you let them see how beautiful violin music is, how much it inspires others, what it does for other people. If they are enamored by it and captured by it, then it'll be their pleasure to learn about the violin. See, James told us to hear first. If you hear what Jesus has done for you, if you listen to the fact that even at your worst, you were more loved than you can ever imagine, you will be enamored by who he is because you've been radically loved by him. You'll be captured by him. You won't do what he says out of compulsion or fear. You'll do it out of joy for the one who gave everything to you when you didn't deserve it. Jesus is saying, if you see what I do for you, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you hear what I have done for you, then you will be a doer. That's why he's saying, be a hearer. If you're a hearer and you don't do, then you're deceiving yourself. Because he's saying, you haven't really heard. That's why you're deceiving yourself. If you don't do, you have not really heard. But this is still a hard saying for me. As I wrestle through trying to unite these things of listening to the gospel and what it tells me, and then seeing that Jesus has called me very clearly to obey him, to follow him, to change how I live my life. How do I unite those two things? How do I sit comfortably with the fact that the Christian life is about knowing I cannot do anything to make God love me more, but I am also called to live a life which is pleasing to him? How do we put that together? That's what living is. That's what living is. If we go back to James's analogy about the mirror for a moment, I'm gonna apologize for anyone I'm about to blind with this mirror. I want you to imagine that this mirror is the gospel. This is the message of everything that Jesus has done for us. When we look into the gospel, when we hear what it says, then the image that we see in this mirror, will be of someone who's loved by God, someone who's dressed in robes of righteousness, someone whose every blemish has been washed away, someone who at their very worst was completely loved by God. When you look at that image, when you walk away from the mirror, if you remember that image, it will compel you to give to other people what's been given to you. Now on the other hand, if you look in this mirror and you see that image and when you walk away, you forget what Jesus has done for you, you forget what Jesus says about you, then you will not be compelled to do anything he says because you'll go back to defining yourself by what you do, by what you think of yourself and what others think of yourself. But if you look in the mirror and you see the image of what God says, and that is the image that goes with you, that you hold on to, then you will, you will delight in showing Jesus to other people and living a life that pleases Jesus because every time you do it, you'll be reminded of that image. You'll remember what you saw. See, living and the unity between hearing and doing is that when you hear, you want to do. And when you do, 
you are reminded of what you heard. When you hear what Jesus has done for you, you want to go give that to someone else because it's so unbelievable. You want to think about the way that you're living your life. You want to build your decisions around what he said. And when you do it, every time you'll be reminded of God's grace towards you, his love and his faithfulness and his dedication towards you, even at your worst. Do you walk away from Sunday services, from a sermon, from reading your Bible, from worship, and forget what you saw in the mirror of the gospel? Do you forget that your God is dedicated towards you? That he loves you apart from what you do? That he's faithful to you when you are unfaithful to him? Do you remember those things, or do you forget? James goes on, he gives us examples of what it looks like to remember what Jesus has done for us. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. Three qualities that he talks about is a controlled tongue, an increased compassion for others, and a devotion to holiness, setting yourself apart from the rest of the world. Those three things happen. That religion that is pure and undefiled happens when you have heard what Jesus has done for you and when you live it out. He says in verse 26, or 25, I apologize, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, it's another way, again, of describing the gospel, the law of liberty. For a Jewish person who'd built their entire life on the Torah and on the, the law of Moses, the law of liberty would mean a law that you are free from condemnation when you fail to, to obey it. You lived apart from what you do. The law of liberty, if you look into that, if that is your mirror that you define yourself by, then you will be blessed in your doing. You'll be transformed by that. Sterling, a few weeks ago, he, he shared a, uh, an analogy about uh, a garden and how we have no control over, once we put that seed in the ground, making it do what it's supposed to do. But we can control the conditions that it grows in. That is what living is really all about, about hearing the word, hearing the implanted word, the seed goes in the ground, doing, building a garden where that can grow to its fullest. Living is seeing those two things working in unison so that the, the fruit of what God has called for in your life can grow, apart from your efforts, but by the Spirit of God in you. We should be slow to speak. We should be the kind of people who control our tongues. We should be the kind of people who give compassion to others, and we should be devoted to holiness because that is what Jesus has done for us. He was dedicated towards holiness. He set himself apart from everything else in the world and obeyed his Father exclusively so that when we don't, we still get the credit for it. He thought about every word that he spoke. He let every word out of his mouth be his Father's word so that when we heard his words, we would hear the love of the Father who is for us and not against us. And he gave compassion to the most afflicted, the most broken, the most in need in society. He was all of that for us so that we could then be that for everyone else. So hearing should inspire our doing and doing necessitates our hearing and remembering the gospel. Jesus loved you and he gave himself for you. Look into that law of liberty. Don't forget what you see in that mirror. You see grace. Wherever the disconnect is for you, don't strive. After you leave this, please don't walk out of here and think that you now need to be a doer. What you really need to be is a hearer, so that you can do. Rest and bury yourself in the words of the gospel. Dig through them, mine through them, and see the God who gave everything for you. The challenge for us that James is setting is to allow everything that Christ has already done for us be the motivation for how we are now to live. Today, tomorrow, and all the days that come after that. So let's be hearers of God's word. Let's be doers of God's word. And let's show the world 
the God who has loved us and gave us a law, not of morality or compulsion or of fear, but of liberty and love. Would you guys pray with me this morning? That you have shown us, the incredible love that you've shown us, even at our worst. Father, let us hear those words again this morning. Let us hear the message of the gospel again, that we are far worse than we could ever imagine, but at the same time, more love than we could ever dare dream. Lord, let those words sink down. Let the implanted words sink down and grow in our hearts, that we might be doers of your word and not hearers only, that we might show the world the God who has so radically and extravagantly loved us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.